Moving swiftly on, then the next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 15111 in the name of Stuart Maxwell on protecting children from harmful content online. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would also further remind uh, those members leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly and indeed invite members of the public leaving the chamber also to leave quickly and quietly, please. I now call on Stuart Maxwell to open the debate. Mr Maxwell, you have seven minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I am delighted to introduce this debate on the very important and topical subject of protecting our children and other vulnerable groups from harmful online content. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome the announcement that the pilot by the British Board of Film Classification to put an aged rating on music videos made by artists signed in the UK is to be made permanent. This has been agreed by not only the major music labels Sony Music, Universal Music and Warner Music, but also by YouTube and Vivo, and this represents a step, big step forward in the regulation of online content. Now, the internet, as we all know, has really only been available in homes for about 20 years. It is new and mostly a mostly unregulated medium. And of course, while it has many advantages, the lack of regulation has created some corresponding problems. Now, these problems have been compounded in recent years by the increasing availability of mobile devices such as tablets and smartphones, which have mean that children who might before have been sitting at the family's PC in the living room are now in their bedrooms where their viewing is entirely unsupervised. Uh, music videos only really began in the 1980s with the rise of MTV, but they quickly became both an integral part of pop songs and quite often a powerful video could help to sell a rather weak song. So music videos make a strong impression and sell records or downloads, giving them great commercial value. Now, the drive for sales has led to increasingly extreme lyrics and extreme videos, and the accessibility of the internet has contributed to that. Songs and images which could never have been commercially successful in the past because they would never have been shown on TV as they were too explicit can be made and streamed on the internet to be viewed by anyone, anywhere, at any time. Now, in the past, people producing music and videos which they wanted to sell to young people had to get past gatekeepers to access radio stations and television by which they could communicate with young people. And the radio and TV stations were licensed and regulated and the organisations which ran the media companies were answerable for the content which they broadcast. Nowadays, music and video producers can talk directly to a child without parents scrutinising or authorising what has been shown or said. Now, we're all aware how impressionable uh, children, and particularly young children, can be, and the highly sexualised or violent, and worst of all, sexually violent content of certain music videos is indeed, I'm sure, a great concern to many of us. Analysis of academic research into music videos has found that women, and disturbingly, particularly black women, are routinely portrayed in a hypersexualized fashion. This objectification of women, particularly along racial lines, is extremely unhealthy both for boys and for girls, and it is right that we shield our children from these disturbing images, and specifically those which glamorize criminality such as drug taking, a particular issue in some rap music videos. I am therefore heartened that after the success of the BBFC pilot for major labels, UK independent music labels are now taking part in a six-month trial to submit their videos to the BBFC for age rating. Now, I do hope they follow the example of the major labels in making this classification permanent. Now, I was interested to note that during the initial trial of the major labels, which took place in 2015, of the 132 videos reviewed, 56 were rated as suitable for children aged 12 or under and given a 12 classification. 53 were given a 15 classification and one video was classified as an 18. Now, this sample shows that about 50% of the music videos produced in a six month period by UK signed artists are unsuitable for those under 15. Yet I would be extremely surprised if they had not been viewed by a large percentage of children under that age. Now, one of the major advantages of this system of classification is that it is, the same, it is the same as for films and is simple and widely understood. Everyone with children will be able to interpret these classifications immediately. In a consultation carried out by the BBFC in 2013 of over 10,000 people across the UK found that the public has great confidence in these classifications. The public agrees with the BBFC's classifications in over 90% of cases. 
95% of parents with children under 15 check the BBFC classification, and 84% of parents with children aged 6 to 15 consider that the BBFC is effective at using age rating classification to protect children from unsuitable content. So the system that is used enjoys a high level of public confidence and support. And this is another heartening feature of this extension of the BBFC's classification system to music videos. Now, it's interesting to note that independent research into the pilot commissioned by the BBFC has shown that 78% of parents would value age ratings on online music videos, and up to 60% of those aged 10 to 17 are watching music videos that they do not think their parents would approve of. Now, a rating system would provide clear guidelines for both parents and children and make it easier for parents to impose and enforce rules in homes across the country about what could be viewed. I believe that many children will also welcome this classification system. I'm sure that there are young children who have been shocked and often distressed by some of the images they happen to have seen, and who would welcome the fact that they would have the security of being able to watch a video knowing that they would not be upset by what it could contain. Let me be clear, this is not about banning material that's suitable for adults. It's making sure that the material that is not suitable for children is not available to children. Now, another heartening development is the decision by Scotland's four mo mobile networks, EE, O2, 3 and Vodafone, to place mobile content that would be rated 18 or R18 by the BBFC behind access controls and internet filters. It is worth noting that R18 is a special category for films that are particularly strong or explicit. R18 DVDs cannot be ordered by mail order and have to be viewed in a specially licensed cinema or sold over the counter in a specially licensed shop. It is particularly important, therefore, that this content is not available to children. The BBFC is the independent regulator of mobile content, and the system voluntarily adopted by the mobile operators means that filters can be put in place by parents to restrict people under 18 from accessing online pornography and other harmful sites such as pro-anorexia sites from their mobile phones. Nevertheless, there is a problem in that children can get access to these sites via their devices through public Wi-Fi in places such as coffee shops and shopping centres. So we have different standards which apply depending on how the information is accessed, whether through a public Wi-Fi system, mobile networks or home broadband. Now, I believe that the time has now come to put stricter controls in place so that age ratings apply to accessing information via public Wi-Fi in order to create a consistent system without loopholes that protects our children and other vulnerable people no matter where they are accessing the internet from. So the BBFC's classification system is clearly a step in the right direction. However, it only applies to online music videos for artists signed to labels in the UK. Non-UK signed artists are not covered by this classification system, and this is a problem. I therefore call upon US labels in particular, from where so much popular music, em popular music emanates, to voluntarily submit their music videos to the BBFC for classification, particularly as some of the most controversial music videos come from the USA. Presiding officer, the BBFC is an independent, non-governmental body which was set up in 1912, so for over 100 years it has been providing guidance for parents on the suitability of films and later on, in fact from 1984, guidance on the suitability of videos for children. It is to be congratulated for extending its role to online content to keep up with changes in technology, and I am pleased to commend the work of the BBFC to the Chamber, whilst at the same time remind, reminding colleagues across this Chamber that there is still some way to go in ensuring a consistent approach to protecting our children from inappropriate materials online. Thanks so much. Now call on Graham Pearson to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Four minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I stand in support of the motion uh, before us today from Stuart Maxwell and uh, congratulate Stuart on bringing this important issue to the attention of Parliament. Uh, the whole aspect of protecting children from harmful content is easily abused in terms of uh, are we being nanny statish in, in the way we uh, approach this issue? Uh, are we creating a problem where many people would say the right of access, the right of freedom is preeminent? Uh, I would uh, offer the view that no, we are not being overly protective. I think there are issues here that Stuart has rehearsed for us uh, in his uh, input, which are of great concern to us. Uh, looking around the chamber, 
and hopefully not being unkind to members who are here, I think this issue would probably be more uh, productively discussed at the Youth Parliament, who would understand the issues uh, a great deal better than the average age of those who sit uh, alongside me today. They are closer to the issue, and as I say, hopefully I'm not being unkind to my colleagues, but there's a, 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 not only a lifetime of difference between our aspects, but I think centuries of difference in terms of the approach that a 16, 17-year-old would take to the matters we discuss, to the ones that we try and, and develop here in the Chamber. Uh, and of course, I thank Graham Pearson for taking an intervention. I think there's maybe potentially one of the <laughs> younger members uh, in the chamber. Uh, I, do, I do agree with his point that it, uh, it should be also for the Youth Parliament to actually have that uh, discussion, have that debate, uh, and potentially they will uh, foster maybe a wider, uh, a wider uh, kind of, uh, contribution uh, from Scotland. But at the same time, certainly as one of the younger members who does have two young children, uh, I do think it's also very uh, relevant and important that this Parliament and potentially other Parliaments and Assemblies uh, within the UK actually have this discussion and debate as well. Give me a little extra time. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I do agree wholeheartedly with uh, what's just been said. Uh, I don't suggest for a moment that this isn't a matter for us, and, and hopefully I gave no impression that that was the case. Uh, it is important, but I think we need to listen to those in, in the youth parliament environment because they have things to tell us that we probably currently are unaware of, particularly in the context of the uh, technologies that we speak of, uh, that we are somewhat distant from the modern developments that occur almost daily. Uh, and we need to try and keep up to date with those developments. And hence, I think Stuart Maxwell has brought to our attention really important to impacts that arise from the access that can be gained to the internet by new developments. Har harmful content online demands that all practical steps necessary to protect children must be taken. And in this fast changing world of new technology, government and other authorities uh, should keep abreast of the developments to maintain security. Uh, I would invite Stuart Maxwell to also consider that not only is it children uh, that uh, need some means of protection, but also vulnerable adults who can be influenced by what they see uh, via their, their various uh, tablets, etc. And as he touched on, it's not solely within the music uh, environment, but also within the games uh, environment too, that, that access to extensive violence and, and attitudes and culture has an impact on individuals who become imbued with similar uh, views. And we've seen played out across the world where people have become involved in extreme violence and death, having spent extensive time viewing um, unpalatable uh, images um, via the internet. Uh, I conducted a Google search uh, this morning on, on the subject of protecting children from harmful contact, and 92 million hits were achieved in less than a second. So this is a matter of deep concern. And yet, the Herald newspaper reported in 2011 that only one in four parents in Scotland had initiated controls on their systems to limit uh, access to the internet to try and protect those people in their family environments from the less uh, or, or from the distasteful images they, that might be otherwise available. So I think a standardised approach is necessary. Uh, I think that the British Board of Film Classification provides a very useful in, input in this regard. But I also think the authorities that oversee gaming too should standardise their approach with the British Board of Film Classification. And without extending uh, my time here at the Chamber, uh, I wholeheartedly uh, support uh, the motion that's put before us today. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Liz Smith. 
Thank you very much, President Officer, and can I thank Stuart Maxwell for bringing this debate to the Chamber, a very topical debate, and, and something um, in the consequences of the, the debate that, that I have been looking at for a long time. I can also wel welcome the, the, the conversation around about classification. I think that's something that's been long overdue, and, and as Graham Pearson said, not just in the movie industry, but also in the games industry. Being the mother of, of two sons, I was all, always a bit alarmed at some of the content of uh, games and music videos that they were exposed to that looked as if that was normalising uh, uh, you know, aspects of everyday life when it's, it shouldn't be normalising that those type of things as, as aspects of every, everyday life. But what I wanted to touch on today, presiding officer, is a topic that I have touched on a few times in this chamber before, um, is the consequences really of our amazing ability to access anything we want, anywhere, anytime, any place, via a, either a, a 3G or a 4G or a, or a Wi-Fi uh, connection, um, and how valuable that is in opening up the world to our young people and giving them aspects and insights into so many things but there's also a dark side to that and the dark side to that is how it can be then used against young people how they can be exposed to things that are alarming that are frightening that can normalize maybe uh, abnormal and, and, and sort of a scary behavior Th those type of consequences are, are where I want to to go with this and in this chamber before um, I raised very early on in the debate um, the issue about revenge porn and how that can be used the sharing of int intimate images can be used the issues around objectification of women and and again, how that can be uh, used to try and normalise a partner behaviour that, that makes it OK to, to uh, uh, get involved in, in some of these things. Um, the issue for me when it comes to young people and the, the sharing of intimate images is how young people can be groomed online, how they can be um, bullied into sharing intimate images of themselves, and then how those images are used. Um, either used on shaming sites, uh, there are some really derogatory names for some of these sites. I will not uh, echo them in our chamber today because they don't merit uh, the, the words, but shaming sites will, will be the cover all for them all, where for some young people that's led to really serious self-harm, to attempted suicides, and in some cases, well documented cases now, actual suicide, where young people have been shamed so much by the sharing of intimate images across um, all uh, platforms, whether it's on the internet or via social media. Um, and where I want to focus the, my final remarks on is obviously the consequences of that, but the internet providers and the social media providers and their responsibility in some of this. I know of many, many young people who have attempted to have some uh, comments and mocked up photographs and actual photographs and uh, images of themselves removed from some of these sites and they find, found that very, very difficult to do because maybe an internet provider that they use in this country is registered in another country, therefore they come under a different jurisdiction and there's an issue about international law and how that should be used to protect our children um, and that's, that's, that's a real worry for me and I think seriously this has to be a serious look. I think internet providers and social media providers should should take a leaf out of the book of the British Board of Film Classification and the work that they are doing to look at how they should take forward some of the ideas that they have. I think you know, the time has come now where we need much, much stronger policies on this, not only for the young people that are accessing some of this, this uh, information and using it maybe to, to bully or shame or uh, uh, re receiving it and it's causing them real uh, desperate alarm. But also for us as parents, um, and not just as parents if you're not a parent, but as the general community, how do we ensure and put pressure on some of these organisations to, to make sure that our young people, when they do go into that amazing world of, of uh, you know, online media and the, the, the benefits that that brings for them, that they're not then exposed to some of the really dark, scary stuff that's in there, but that they can handle it as well. And us as parents and as, as, as the adults in their lives have, are, are equipped with that information to ensure that we can then support young people when they do have uh, that uh, type of experience. And I think it's a debate that's a long time coming. It's a debate that we should not stop having. And I think as the, the speed of you know, technology moves on, we have to be fleet of foot and move with that speed as well. And I would be really keen to hear that. And just my final comment is, in, uh, in Europe, 
and the European Union, there is um, the European communities, they're looking at doing something that's European wide on this. And I think that's maybe something we should always keep a weather eye on as well and ensuring that if we can do this across boundaries and across borders, then it takes away that issue of an internet provider being uh, registered in a different country and therefore saying, not our problem, it's a different jurisdiction. Um, and that's where I'd like to go with this. But uh, thanks for uh, um, bringing the debate to the Chamber. Um, and uh, I think it's, as I say, it's something we should continue to, to focus on. Thanks so much. I now call on Liz Smith, after which move the closing speech to the Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, can I congratulate uh, Stuart Maxwell on bringing this debate to Parliament because it's quite clearly an extremely important one and can also uh, pay tribute to the preceding speakers who I think have uh, made some excellent points. Um, the fact that children and young people are accessing uh, potentially harmful content online is a matter that concerns us all and that can be particularly the case I think when it comes to music videos given their uh, very wide ranging popularity um, which uh, obviously I didn't have until very recently uh, the age ratings and parents are quite clearly uh, very right to be worried about the ease of access uh, to these and the challenges that that presents uh, as have just been set out by uh, Christina McKelvey because uh, it's very well known that some of these music videos contain uh, very explicit uh, violent and sexual imagery that is uh, totally uh, unsuitable. So it's of paramount importance that parents are empowered with the, the tools that uh, Graham Pearson uh, spoke about to make informed choices for their children. Uh, Stuart Maxwell is very clear in his motion about the research that has been undertaken uh, by the British Board of the uh, Film Classification. Uh, Notice in the motion that 78% you know, of parents uh, would uh, value age ratings for online uh, videos, 70% for parents and children under the age of 12 are worried about the children being exposed to inappropriate content. And furthermore, obviously, uh, the same body has found that many as 60% of the children actually surveyed uh, said that they have watched music videos which they know that the parents would uh, really not approve of. So, you know, I think this uh, is a message from children just as much as it is uh, from the adults. And I think it's the combination, actually, of uh, parents uh, and their children uh, that actually can take us uh, quite a long way forward in trying to address it. In October uh, 2014, the UK government uh, launched its pilot programme, as uh, Stuart Maxwell spoke about, uh, in conjunction with uh, Vivo and uh, YouTube, as well as with the major UK music labels to introduce the new rating system. And I think uh, that the early signs are that that is proving uh, to be uh, very successful. Uh, and I'm pleased that the, the, the success of that uh, pilot scheme uh, is something that has obviously uh, captured the imagination of some other aspects of uh, industry in the UK. Uh, so can I take the opportunity to uh, commend the BBFC, the YouTube and Vivo, uh, as well as the wider UK music industry for the voluntary and very proactive role, I have to say, that they have undertaken. And actually the people who have uh, come to this parliament to help us to be more informed about it, uh, I think they deserve great credit uh, for doing uh, just that. Uh, I think it's a very positive uh, step in preventing uh, children from uh, viewing the harmful content online. But I think Christina McKelvey made an important point about being able to understand uh, the choices that they have to make. And that's something that I think, um, you know, has to uh, get back to parents. And uh, uh, Graham Pearson uh, made perhaps the ageist, but nonetheless very sensible comment about the fact that we should be taking uh, advice from those who are uh, perhaps a bit closer to it than some of uh, the rest of us. Of course, that's not to say there isn't a great deal more work to do uh, one vital step is to ensure that the age ratings are linked to the online uh, parental controls. Um, and uh, uh, Stuart Maxwell mentioned about the uh, activities of the phone companies. I think that's uh, very positive uh, as well. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, can I uh, warmly uh, welcome the progress that has been made to date? Yes, of course. Stuart Maxwell. I'll say, I'll say this now because I, I'll probably never say it again. Can I, can I just commend the, the work of the, of the UK Prime Minister? Uh, on this issue. I know he has personally taken um, uh, a very close interest in it and intervened directly. I think perhaps his wife has had some role in that, but he has directly intervened to support the work of pushing this, this forward. Can I ask you, as a Conservative member, perhaps to urge him to uh, redouble his efforts in ensuring that we spread this out, not just to other independent producers of music videos in the UK, but talk to other uh, countries that he can do in a way that none of us can, uh, to ensure that perhaps US artists voluntarily, US companies, sign up to, to the same uh, classification. Uh, I think that's a kind uh, comment to make. I think it's a very uh, true 
uh, reflection of David Cameron's interest, uh, I think you'll be pushing at an open door because uh, I, I know for a fact uh, that he is uh, very, very determined on this issue. I'm sure the uh, minister herself has probably had uh, discussions on this, but yes, I will certainly undertake to ensure that I pass it on. Many thanks. Um, and we now move to closing speech from the minister and now call on Aileen Campbell. Uh, Minister, you have seven minutes all the year by. Thank you very much, President Officer. And uh, like all the other speakers this afternoon, I'm also grateful to Stuart Maxwell for bringing this important issue to debate and for creating the space for us all to contribute in what has been a very responsible uh, debate, allowing us to consider what more we need to do to keep our children safe, because the protection of children's wellbeing is the responsibility of all of us, and we each have a duty to take the steps we can to ensure that children and young people are not exposed to harm and that this is the case in our increasingly digital world as much as it is in our homes, our schools, our businesses, and also in our communities. And whilst matters of internet regulation remain reserved to the UK Government, I encourage uh, and continue to encourage the UK Government to collaborate with us fully through the UK Council on Child Internet Safety in recognition of Scotland's devolved responsibilities in key areas of internet safety. And I say that because um, it took the Scottish Government a bit of work to try and make sure we were always involved in those discussions uh, as well. So notwithstanding the Prime Minister's clear uh, uh, commitment to this, there needs to be an understanding that these things transcend uh, boundaries and that there is a real in importance for us within our devolved responsibilities of keeping children safe for that door to always and continually uh, be open. Uh, and like uh, Graham Pearson and Stuart McMillan, uh, I recognise the need for young people uh, to have input into this discussion because young people, I think as Graham Pearson was trying to say without trying to offend us in our uh, ages, uh, young people are not necessarily to be found on Facebook uh, because that's where often their grandparents are and we need to understand that as new things develop uh, we need to know where our young people are. If we want to know where our young people are when they're offline then that has to be as true for the situations when they are online uh, and we need to stay ahead of the game because that's it, why it's important that we get young people involved in these discussions because they are the ones that can inform us about what's uh, important and how they are communicating with their uh, peers. And like uh, Stuart Stevenson and Liz Smith and others, I welcome the voluntary steps being taken by the UK music industry to ensure that music videos are given age ratings by the British Board of Film Classification. And I'm committed to ensuring that we continue to work with the BBFC as part of their advisory consultative committee and with other partners within industry to see if more can be done to influence companies based overseas who have not yet committed to this initiative to do so. Allied to this uh, is the decision noted by Stuart Maxwell of the four main mobile networks to place content rated I-18 or R-18 by the BBFC behind access controls, meaning that this content can be excluded by parental controls. And these are clearly important signals by industry that they are taking seriously the very valid concerns of parents about the ease with which children can access inappropriate content. And I also welcome the scheme which allows businesses to display the friendly Wi-Fi symbol to show that the Wi-Fi provided by them is filtered and safe for children and young people to use. But while these developments are very welcome steps, they should not ever allow for complacency. There is still a myriad of ways in which children may be exposed to harmful content, whether that be on the covers of newspapers or magazines that are displayed in shops and newsagents that are within a child's eye line or online. Uh, the most significant online risk faced by our uh, children and young people are not those that will be easily eliminated by increasing parental controls or fi filters. And the increase in peer-to-peer -peer sharing of indecent images, uh, revenge, porn, uh, revenge porn, as Christina McKelvey noted, uh, the growth in live streaming of child sexual exploitation, the grooming for the purposes of blackmail and exploitation, the objectification of women, all happen on platforms that lie outside the specifics mentioned within uh, the motion. And of course, the uh, majority of content uploaded is not subject to a classification system that lends itself to the parental controls or effective filters. And that recent uh, Ofcom survey demonstrated that many parents choose not to employ parental controls. So while parents want to have more control, there are in some cases uh, for many reasons, uh, they're not taking that action. And of course, the reasons for that are many and varied. Some parents feel that their children can be trusted without the need for additional controls, while others point out that their children are never unsupervised 
while they are online. However, a significant proportion reported concerns that setting up controls appeared complicated and beyond their technical know-how. Industry, therefore, has a continued role in ensuring that these controls are accessible to as many people that wish to use them. But there's also clearly a job of work for us to do as well. And that's why the Scottish Government's digital participation strategy focuses efforts on helping everyone to develop the skills and confidence to become di active digital citizens, enabling parents with those concerns to have help available should they wish to use it. And the Scottish Stakeholder Group for Child Internet Safety will work also with Police Scotland and other key partners in coordinating our response to these challenges in conjunction with the work being undertaken as a result of our National Action Plan on Child Sexual Exploitation. Because we must make, uh, make absolutely clear to perpetrators of online crime that the full force of the law will be brought to bear on them. We must not forget that the responsibility for crimes being committed online lies with those committing the offence and we must ensure that deterrents are as robust as they possibly can be. Moreover, the National Sexual Crimes Unit within the Crown Office is doing important work in increasing successful convictions of sexual crime and the Police Scotland's National Child Abuse Investigations Unit complements this by providing consistent, high quality support for robust investigations into reports of complex child abuse and neglect, including child sexual exploitation and online child abuse. We should also acknowledge the work that practitioners do to protect children every day, either in education or other children's services. There are many examples of original and creative approaches being developed by schools and youth groups to educate our children and young people about the risks in a meaningful way that engages with them where they are. But I also think it's important to remember that we must not demonise the internet. As many members have noted, children and young people use the internet in ways unimaginable to those of us who did not grow up in this digital age. And we all want to see a Scotland where children are encouraged and enabled to benefit the huge opportunities offered by digital technologies. We don't want to push uh, our young people into dark, scary places that uh, I think in the words that Christina uh, McKelvey used, uh, by constantly demonising the internet, our language needs to be and our, and our actions need to be uh, appropriate. So in uh, summary, Presiding Officer, I welcome the approaches taken so far by the industry while recognising that more can and more should be done. Parental controls are clearly an important tool, but the use of these technical controls must be seen as a supplement to rather than a replacement for broader approaches that make it clear that parents do not shoulder the full weight of keeping children safe online. We must ensure that children, Scotland is seen as a hostile environment for online crimes while promoting the digital world as an essential to our growth and our prosperity and encouraging and enabling all of our citizens to take part in online life to the fullest extent and to do that in the safest possible way. So once again, I extend my thanks to Stuart uh, Maxwell and the rest of the members who took part in today's debate and I look forward to continuing this dialogue as we can try and to continually strive to make sure that our children can grow up safe from harm, especially on the online world. Thank you. Thanks, and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until two o'clock this afternoon.